you know, I think we all know how impactful space telescopes have been and the incredible science and understanding they've enabled um, as a result of putting eyes uh, someplace other than on Earth. So the Hubble Space Telescope was a complete game changer and transformative in what it has taught us about the cosmos. Uh, interesting as well and, and fascinating for what it has revealed, in my opinion, one of the most uh, impactful and profound programs in NASA's history is the Kepler Space Telescope, which taught us that planets are everywhere. Well, tonight we're going to be talking about the next generation of space telescopes that are in the planning phases right now. There's a, a whole program of mission concepts that NASA goes through where they look ahead to the next decade and they put together teams to propose and uh, conceive and then propose uh, ideas uh, for new space telescopes, new research platforms, but tonight, of course, it's telescopes. So we're going to hear from three uh, individuals this evening who are part of the so-called Science and Technology Definition Teams, or STDT, for three different missions. We're going to talk about the Habitable Exoplanet Observatory, or HABEX. We'll be speaking about the large UV optical infrared surveyor mission concept called Louvoir. And we're going to be also hearing about a space uh, telescope concept mission called Origins. Um, and tonight we have three very esteemed guests to talk to us about these telescopes. And we're going to have a little fun. It isn't um, really a competition. Again, these are our scientists trying to make a case for, for the various kinds of missions that uh, uh, are supported and um, suggested by these telescopes. But tonight, we're going to ask you, at the end, to vote on which one you like the best. So you're going to get to play you know, NASA administrator or you know, vice president of taxpayer funding. Yeah, you, it's going to be like, uh, like so. And uh, so we'll give you the opportunity to uh, see who has had the most compelling uh, mission uh, put forward this evening. And we'll also give you a question to, uh, an opportunity to ask some questions at the end, so we'll get to that as well. We are uh, live streaming tonight, as I mentioned, on our Facebook channel. And um, if those of you uh, out there in Facebook land are so inclined, we will also be taking some questions uh, from our virtual audience. We would ask you to send those questions as tweets, however, not, not through the Facebook channel. We have Rebecca here watching our Twitter page, which is hashtag SETI Talks. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask one of our speakers, go to hashtag SETI Talks, ask your question, and we'll try to get it in and, and, uh, and address it this evening. So without further ado, I'd like to ask our speakers to come forward. I'll introduce them one at a time and give you a little background on each one, and starting with Dr. Kimberly Aniko Smith. So Kimberly, if you would come on up, and I'll introduce you. So um, Dr. Smith is a NASA research astrophysicist at the NASA Ames Research Center right here in Silicon Valley in Mountain View, about five minutes from our office. She's, a multi, she's multidisciplinary in her approach to space instruments, telescopes, and mission concepts. She's designed and built infrared, airborne, and space telescope cameras and spectrometers, tested detectors and laboratories and particle accelerators, designed low-cost suborbital orbital instruments, built lunar payloads, and most recently served as deputy project scientist leading the calibration for the New Horizons Pluto flyby mission, which uh, Frank just talked about, uh, and project scientist for the Flying Infrared Observatory, SOFIA, which is another program that the Institute is intimately involved with. So, uh, Kimberly, welcome. Um, <clears throat> Next up, Professor Scott Gowdy. So, Scott, come on up. Scott is a leader in the discovery and statistical characterization of extrasolar planets using a variety of methods, including transits and gravitational microlensing. In 2008, he and his collaborators announced the discovery of the first Jupiter-Saturn analog. Professor Gowdy is deeply immersed in analytical and numerical techniques for assessing the yield, biases, and discovery potential of current and next-generation surveys, to determine the demographics of exoplanets. Didn't think exoplanets had demographics, but they do. Uh, more broadly, his interests revolve around the information content of large data sets. Scott is a member of the science definition team, the SDTTs, for NASA's Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope, WFIRST, which many of you have, uh, are familiar with, and is the chair-elect for uh, the NASA Exoplanet Exploration Analysis Group. Uh, Scott is widely recognized within the community for his work. He was 2009 recipient of the Helen B. Warner Prize of the American Astronomical Society, 
received NSF Career and uh, PKS awards, was named a University Distinguished Scholar in 2016, and in 2017, he was awarded the NASA Outstanding Public Leadership Medal uh, for his, uh, in recognition of his outstanding leadership as the Exoplanet Program Analysis Group Chairperson, having significant impact on NASA's search for exoplanets and life in the universe. Scott Gowd. Those award events, by the way, they don't necessarily have the drama of the red carpet of the Grammys, but they are far more important awards, <laughs> far more and profound. So, uh, and third up, we have Courtney Dressing. Courtney, come on up. Courtney is an assistant professor of astronomy at UC Berkeley. As an observational astronomer, she has focused the re her research on detecting and characterizing planetary systems orbiting nearby stars. She has used telescopes on the ground and in space to search for planets, probe their atmospheres, measure their masses, and constrain their bulk compositions. Courtney is curious about how planets form and evolve with time, the frequency of planetary systems in the galaxy, and the prospects for detecting life on planets outside our solar system near and dear to our hearts at the SETI Institute. So welcome all of you. Uh, the format to, to tonight, this is... This is the Space Telescope answer to The Bachelor, okay? And uh, so we're going to kick it off. Each of our bachelors and bachelorettes is going to uh, present a very brief overview of the, their mission concept, their telescope, and then we're going to sit down and have a conversation. So uh, first up will be Kimberly. Good evening, and before I begin, tonight you're gonna to hear about three amazing space telescopes. There's actually a fourth one that's not represented tonight. It's called LYNX. It is an X-ray telescope that will uh, reveal the invisible universe. And uh, as you hear the three concepts tonight, keep in mind there's also another one that's not represented. I'm here to share with you uh, about the Origin Space Telescope. But let's be a little bit, take a step back and be a little bit philosophical. Origins is about where did we come from? What is the origin of life's essential elements? Carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. How did the universe evolve as life's ingredients were changing? How did planets become habitable so they can support life. How common would these life-bearing planets be? These are questions that are going to be answered by the Origin Space Telescope. So what you're seeing on the slide um, is a concept of a cold, big, sensitive and fast space telescope. Being cold at 4.5 Kelvin makes it extremely sensitive with very low backgrounds. Big, it has the same collecting area as the James Webb Space Telescope, 25 square meters. Sensitive, this baby is a thousand times more sensitive than any prior infrared telescope. And it's fast. Being infrared, the way the observatory is going to be looking um, between 2.8 microns and 590 microns. About half of life, half of the light from stars, planets, galaxies is emitted at these wavelengths. Being fast, it's designed from the start to be scanning across the sky. It will speed at 60 arc seconds a second. In comparison, James Webb would cover that in about two minutes. So at 60 arc seconds a second, about one arc minute a second, it could cover the full moon in 30 seconds. This is very powerful and transformative. It is a discovery telescope. The three orders of magnitude of sensitivity will open up a huge discovery space for all astronomy. It will be positioned at L2, where a lot of the big telescopes are going. Um, it has only one deployable, the sun shield. 
So it has become a much more compact, but yet very powerful and agile telescope. Um, and it's serviceable. NASA is embarking on developing the Lunar Gateway. This could be um, an, a telescope that can be serviceable. So I want to spend the rest of my pitch about the anchor themes behind the observatory. So how do stars, galaxies, black holes, and the elements of life form over the lifetime of the universe? This is one of the anchor themes of the observatory. Our Milky Way, 12 billion years old, has taken a long time to become a spiral galaxy fueled with a central uh, black hole. But what about other galaxies? What you're seeing here is a spectroscopic survey that is enabled because of its fast mapping capabilities. We can do an unbiased, deep survey of millions of galaxies. For the astronomers in the audience, this is what the Sloan Digital Sky Survey <laughs> did for optical astronomy. We're going to be able to see the rise of metals, the rise of dust, the rise of organics, and how that um, came to be the universe we have today. So we'll be able to probe the universe from today to 500 million years after the Big Bang, studying millions of galaxies spectroscopically, their composition, their star formation rate, and have us understand how did life's ingredients evolve over time. And essentially, we've made a look-back machine, a time machine, to find out what happened to our origins. A second anchor theme is looking at what are the conditions for making a planet habitable. And in particular, we're interested in the trail of water. We have known that we're putting together pieces of the trail of water story, but we don't really have a clear vision. And so Origins will look at the formation of water in the interstellar medium as the clouds are collapsing to form stars, which is a short period of time, only hundreds of thousands of years, to the disks in which the planets are forming, which is millions of years, tens of millions of years. In particular, we're going to look for the snow line. These are areas in a protoplanetary disk where planets could be forming. We'll be looking at how waters even deliver to our own solar system, a mature solar system. Because if the Earth formed within the, solar, within the snow line, yet the water that on the Earth has a signature as it came from beyond the solar, uh, snow line, we want to answer those questions. So we're looking at paving a pathway to find water, which is a life-enabling ingredient through all phases from the birth of stars to the planetary systems. And finally, with this other spectrometer at the shorter wavelengths, um, at the sort of 2 to 20 micron, we're going to address how common are life-bearing worlds around M dwarf stars. M dwarf stars are the most uh, populous. There's 75% of uh, the stars in our Milky Way are M dwarfs. We will build upon the discoveries of many stars planets around M dwarfs from Trappist, Mirth, Kepler, and other surveys that will come between now and 20, the 2030s when Origins is flying. We're going to look for bioindicators, water and carbon dioxide. We're going to look for biosignatures, methane and ozone, whose presence there would indicate life. And so three anchor, um, this is the fingerprint um, of uh, life-bearing worlds. So, in short, Origins will do a lot more. It has a huge discovery space. It's all about where did we come from and the evolution of life from the <clears> beginning <throat> of the epoch of reionization, which is 500 million years after the Big Bang to today. We'll be looking at how uh, the rise of metals, the rise of dust, how water is transported to habitable systems, and how common they are. So it, it'll be a transformative observatory for the um, greater all the astronomy community, and we're very excited that this will answer and transform the understanding of our cosmic origins. Thank you. What do you think? Good pitch? <laughs> not, not bad. <laughs> all right. Kimberly, uh, thank you very much. And Scott, you're up with Habex. <clears throat> okay, um, so before I start, um, I, I'm really glad that Kimberly mentioned this fourth uh, study, Lynx. 
Um, all four studies uh, have been going on now for over three years. Um, they've involved hundreds of astronomers, uh, people working in, for the, at NASA, people working in industry, and, well, quite a bit of money as well. Um, and I want to say that to impress upon you that these are not simple back-of-the-envelope kind of studies. These are real studies that have that where we've come up with specific science goals, and then we've actually done the full tracing of how we can actually accomplish that goals, what is the technologies that we need to do that, what kind of telescope architecture do we need to be able to achieve those goals. So what you see here is the HABEX mission, uh, and, it and it's an artist's conception, of course, but it's based on actual computer-aided design drawings. Right? There is a, the actual engineering, extremely difficult engineering, went into designing this particular mission and all four of these missions. Okay? So these are not, these are, these are not just uh, you know, stories that we're telling ourselves. Um, in this case, in the case of HABEX, there's actually two components of it, and I'll get back to that in a second. Um, HABEX has three main science goals, uh, and, uh, and HABEX itself stands for the Habitable Exoplanet Observatory, so you might not be surprised that one of those science goals is to actually directly detect, actually, I wasn't supposed to do that, um, uh, directly detect uh, and characterize potentially habitable planets. The other is to understand those potentially habitable planets in the context of the planetary systems that they live in by then uh, taking spectra and understanding the properties of a much broader suite of planets. And then finally, it'll be a successor to Hubble in the sense that it'll have uh, sensitivity in the optical, uh, ultraviolet, and near-infrared and enable many of the, of, of the studies that we've seen come out of Hubble, which, has been, which have been incredible and transformative, but they will be actually even more powerful because HABEX is actually a 4-meter telescope rather than a 2.4-meter telescope. HABEX's basic philosophy has been to try to achieve these science goals and in particular, the science goal of actually detecting a potentially habitable Earth-like planet orbiting a Sun-like star, looking to see if that planet is potentially habitable and looking for signatures of perhaps life. Um, we've, been, we've taken a philosophy of being fairly conservative and cost-conscious um, to try to do this with the minimum amount of risk um, um, possible. Now, in order to detect an Earth-mass planet uh, orbiting a Sun-like star, uh, at a distance of typically sort of 30 light years, which is the typical distances we're going to be looking at, um, you have to suppress the light from that um, star by a factor of one, t one in 10 billion. Okay? And that star, that planet is located only 0.1 arc seconds away from its host star. So the analogy is that it's like trying to look for a firefly about five feet away from an, uh, an industrial searchlight that you would see in a Hollywood premiere except the searchlight and the firelight are in L.A., and you're standing in New York City. Um, so that sounds really hard, uh, but I actually went and looked up how luminous a firefly was. Uh, it turns out that's not so easy. Uh, you can't just find it on Wikipedia. I went and looked up uh, how uh, luminous a uh, searchlight was, so I found some industrial owner's manuals and looked it up, and I had to learn what a candela was. Um, and it turns out that actually a firefly is about a thousand times brighter compared to a searchlight than a firefly is compared, uh, than the, the Earth is compared to the sun. So this problem is even a thousand times harder. We have two ways we think we can suppress this light uh, without, in, so getting rid of 10 billion photons and keeping that one photon from the planet. One of them is called a star shade, and that's what's illustrated here in this cartoon. It literally is a large star-shaped shade that would fly about 100,000 kilometers away from the telescope. Uh, it's about the size of a baseball diamond. Of course, you can't just throw that up in the air. You have to have, do fancy ways of unfurling it. Um, we use uh, techniques of origami to do that. Um, and, so, uh, and, and then you have to be able to deploy it uh, the edges have to be manufactured to a micron. They have to deploy to within a few millimeters, and you have to make it uh, align with the telescope but, uh, by a few meters. That's, and so that's the challenge that we face with the star shade. Uh, but if you can do that, then it suppresses the light from the star exceptionally well. The second method, which is a method that Louvoir will actually also use to detect and characterize Earth-like planets, is um, apparently I have to agree to some iTunes... Why am I not seeing my <laughs> do that? Okay. Oh, come on. Really? I, I can't even get that cursor. Help? Oh. Oh. 
go. Got it. I don't see it here. The chronograph. It's all the way over on the right. Here it is. How do I eat? Oh, but I, I want to... Go left. All right. All right. I'm just going to go on. Okay. So I, I didn't realize that it started. Um, okay. So coronography, it works differently. In coronography, what you actually do is... Um, you actually let, let the light from the star into the telescope, okay? And then what you do is you put a essentially a small disk um, that would block the light in the central uh, part where the star is to block the light from the star. Uh, but since the planet is coming in, light is coming in at an angle, it will pass by the disk. Sounds pretty easy. Well, the problem is that you actually, again, have to block 10 billion photons for every one photon from the, from the planet. And that means any imperfection in your optics uh, will screw this up and will scatter light. And you do not have to scatter many photons to make the planet essentially invisible. So you have to do something very fancy, again, where you have this, uh, uh, what's called a, a, a coronagraph that blocks the light. And again, if your optics were perfect, then you would be able to see the planet. But because your optics are not perfect, your wave fronts are, uh, are not uh, stationary, and so you have to do use fancy things like deformable mirrors to flatten out your wave fronts to then therefore make the light travel along the path that you need and you want um, so that you can block the light from the star and then not from the planet. And so HabEx is going to use actually both of these technologies uh, to try to detect and characterize Earth-like planets and eventually look for signatures of uh, habitability, uh, uh, potential habitability, um, so signatures of water vapor, an atmosphere, um, ozone, things like that, and also signs of life uh, like ozone, oxygen, and maybe even methane if we're exceptionally lucky. If you're interested in wanting to know why we chose both technologies instead of one or the other, I'm happy to answer that during the questions. All right, what do you think? Are you sold? Did you like that one? Yeah. It's the big shield, I think, that's the, that's the real attraction here. All right. And Courtney. You're Great. Up. Thanks. I'll be telling you about the Large UV Optical Infrared Surveyor. This concept is one of the four that you've heard about before. And our mission is designed to allow us to do both general astrophysics and planetary science. So we designed it as a large facility that was equally capable of detecting an Earth-like planet around a sun-like star and telling us about how the universe formed and evolved in the first place. I said it's large, so how large is it? Let's go to Earth orbit, look at the Hubble Space Telescope, and put them side by side to compare. Here we are in Earth orbit with the Hubble Space Telescope. We're going to zoom away, and then we'll see Louvoir. Those of you who've seen Star Wars might understand where this is coming from. <laughs> quite large. What you're seeing there is actually the shield that we'll use to block the sunlight so it won't get into the telescope. Our telescope itself has two designs. We have architecture A, which is 15.1 meters across. That's pretty big. And then we have architecture B, which is 8 meters across, which is also big. That's twice the size of Scott's telescope. It's remarkably and similar <laughs> to Star Wars, isn't it? And with those <laughs> large telescopes, what we can do is collect a lot of light. That means we can search stars that are farther away and find a larger sample of Earth's. It also means that we can collect light quickly and take very deep images, just like the Hubble Deep Field, only we can do it much better over larger parts of the sky and make you even prettier tote bags and scarves than the ones you purchase with Hubble images. <laughs> you can see that video and more at the California Academy of Sciences. With Louvoir, we're going to take pictures that look like this. Scott nicely explained coronography, which is the technique that Louvoir will use to take an image like this. We'll use the coronagraph inside the telescope to block out the light from the star. That particular instrument is called eclipse, because we're eclipsing the star. And that will allow us to see any planets that might be visible. Here, this is what our solar system would look like if we were observing it with Louvoir with a 12-meter telescope. So that's smaller than our large architecture and bigger than our small architecture. Here you can see Venus close to the inner edge, and that funky thing in the middle is showing that we've blocked out the star. You're not seeing the star there. You're seeing what's left over after we've removed the starlight. We also have Earth, nice there on the side, and we have Jupiter. When we take an image like this, it's not just a single image. And we're also not taking a picture of what the planet actually looks like. Earth and other planets aren't resolved. We're just seeing a single point of light 
that's spread over multiple pixels in this image here. What we can do then is for this image, we can take a spectrum for each of those planets and look for signatures in the atmospheric spectrum. We'll look for oxygen and ozone and methane and try to find things in combinations that wouldn't exist if they weren't being actively created. With Loire, we'll take a large sample of stars and look for all of them to try to figure out how common life is in the universe. We'll be able to look at enough stars that if we don't find anything, we will be able to place limits on the frequency of life in the universe that are quite meaningful. Hopefully, though, we'll get lucky and we'll find life on multiple planets. We have a lot to consider. Here on the left, you can see a plot showing the number of planets on which we expect to be able to take spectra with Louvoir. On the left side, that green bar shows that we'll find about 50 planets that are roughly Earth-sized, Earth temperature, in the habitable zones of their stars that might be good candidates for life. For each of those planets, we'll take more detailed observations to look for those biosignatures. The other red and blue bars show you that we'll find planets of a range of temperatures, both hotter than the Earth and colder than the Earth, and a range of sizes, from things that are smaller than the Earth all the way up to planets that are the size of Jupiter. And for each of those planets, we're going to learn a lot. We'll be able to understand how planetary systems form and evolve with time and try to figure out what makes our solar system different or similar to other planets. There was a movie that was going to show on the right there, which is why I advanced early, but I can show it to you later. Here, we're showing you that Louvoir isn't just going to tell us about planets far away from home. It will also allow us to study the planets and the moons in our own solar system. On the left here, you see what Hubble can do when it looks at Europa. And you probably know that there are really interesting plumes coming from Europa that might contain organics from a subsurface ocean. It'd be nice to be able to resolve those plumes, like we can with Louvoir on the right, and do time monitoring to see exactly when they erupt and understand how the structure changes over time and maybe how the composition of the plumes changes with time. We can do that with Louvoir. And we can also study things like the atmospheres of Jupiter and then compare it to our observations of planets far away. And of course, compare our own Earth to observations of other potentially habitable worlds. I'm incredibly excited about Louvoir, and I hope that you all are too. Thanks. So that's also pretty cool, wouldn't you agree? So it's a tough choice. Um, let me uh, start with Kimberly and ask uh, a question. You, you talked about the operating temperature of the telescope. Space telescopes do have different operating temperatures. And uh, when you talk about um, the Origins telescope, it's going to be like 4 or 5 Kelvin. 4.5 Kelvin. Yeah, so yeah. what is the significance of that? What does that enable that... Uh, is, gives it unique capability. Well, thanks for the question, and it's a huge deal. And this is where the brain thinking of the architecture of, of origins, realizing that we need to get cold. Uh, James Webb is also an infrared telescope, and it uh, cools its instruments, but its telescope is passively cold. And it gets to about 30 or 40 Kelvin. When you get below um, to the lower temperatures, we're reducing the background significantly. Our diameter of our telescope is 5.9 meters. Um, we have the same collecting area as James Webb. We're actually more sensitive, James Webb, at the longer wavelengths. Because as you go out to the longer infrared wavelengths, uh, the lower your background is, the more sensitive you are. With previous telescopes, infrared telescopes have given us glimpses of the universe, they have not been cooled. Um, the technology for cryocoolage is highly mature. They're of a high technical, technical readiness level. So it's not a concern for the observatory. And we have a design where we have uh, redundancy in our cooling. And we have different cooling phases. But the cooling enables the sensitivity, this factor of 1,000 in sensitivity. Wonderful. And um, now I've uh, seen references to the size of the origins. And I think the architecture is also similar to James Webb and uh, uh, and the uh, Louvoir, or is, is it no, that we, type we, of...? No, it's, it's now smaller. And this ah, is okay. because we've, or we're being cost realists. <laughs> um, we That's live in unique. a cost <laughs> realism you know, scenario. <laughs> yeah. We had a very I ambitious you know first <laughs> origins concept, which was a nine meter. This is what we really wanted. Yeah. You know. well, we did an interesting good science trade study on what would still be three orders of magnitude than what we have today. We were trying to give up six orders of magnitude and go to three orders of magnitude. And so we shrank our telescope. 
such that we don't have the, the deployables of the pedals or the sun shields and all that stuff. We actually fit monolithically, although we're made up of segments, in an SLS or a BFR from SpaceX, we can launch in a single fairing without these deployables. But yes, our original concept was a lot more grand. We took in cost realism and made some uh, strategic choices in where the science discovery space is still maintained. And uh, that's the design that I'm showing. So, uh, and so both Louvoir and Habex are operating in the infrared, the optical, and the UV. The near, the near, near. infrared. The near infrared, infrared. Right. Okay. So only out to about two microns. Out to two so microns. So there's no overlap in the wavelength range yeah. between OST and Louvoir and Habex. Right. Okay. And that's because of the different operating temperature yeah. and our different so design decisions. We're operating right. at, at a much higher temperature. Yeah, yeah we actually heat will our cover telescope. What portion of the spectrum? Uh, so Habex will cover p between uh, about, uh, uh, sorry, 0.125 mic microns to about two microns. Okay. And, and towards the end of that, that's where we start getting thermally background limited um, because our, our telescope is not so cool. And I believe it's We're, very similar for... Right. Lunar. And depending on your science case, you can go a little bit redder if you have right. a brighter object. Right. Okay. And origins? Uh, 2.8 to about 590 microns. Ah, okay. So out to the longer wavelengths. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, so, Scott... Um, I don't want to say that Kimberly sounded dismissive, but somewhat <laughs> suspicious of the star shield. <laughs> uh, star shade. So, so let's let's. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm let's get the terminology right. The star shade. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's there's two technologies here that we're talking about that that um, that all of these teams are talking about. One is a, a sun shield, um, and that's the uh, that's the that I think that is your one deployable, mm -hmm. um, and that's to, that's to do the passive cooling and then you have active cooling, if I understand That's correctly. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, for Louvoir, they have this, this very large uh, death star, uh, d destroyer <laughs> sun shield. We, we come in peace and it's <laughs> mixing science fiction <laughs> genres. But. No, this, this very large sun shield so that they can actually have a very large field of regard exactly. and, not, and not have the contaminating light from the sun. Um, the Habex has a much uh, more traditional uh, 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 sun shield where it's actually part of the telescope itself. Uh, similar to things like Kepler and others, um, and that's also where we get our power. Um, and then there's the star shade, and that's something that is unique to Habex. Um, this is the this is the the petal shape thing that has to unfurl um, and uh, would block the light from the parent star. Um, star shades are very nice because they're um, exceptionally good at blocking the light from the star because the light never from the star never enters the telescope. Um, the challenges are, of course, uh, that you have to make it unfurl to this precision, and you have to make it uh, do formation flying, and you have to manufacture those petals. But uh, if you think about it, manufacturing a petal uh, edge to a one micron, when we're actually now able to take individual atoms and move them, right, is not actually that challenging. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that uh, to, the, to the skeptics, always good to be skeptic, but the star shade technology has actually come a very long way. And I just want to mention one other thing, because I think this is important for LUVAR as well. Even 10 years ago, we would not have been able to do probably any of right. these missions. But uh, for Habex in particular, there's three things that we've learned uh, that enable Habex uh, to be uh, realizable in the next sort of few decades. One is that Kepler has told us that small planets are common. We did not know that. Um, this is also important for one of your pillars. Um, we did not know small planets are common, so we now know that there are going to be targets out there. Um, in the case of Habex and Lavoir, we also know that stars aren't so too dusty to hide their parent uh, their, to their their planets. We thought they might be. Now we know that there probably aren't. And the third thing, and again, I think this probably applies to OST as well, uh, is that our technology has come an enormous, a very long way. Coronography, uh, uh, the star shade technology, I'm sure the, pa the active and passive cooling technologies have come a long way um, due to focus investments by NASA and industry, um, as such that these three missions are really things that we actually think we know how to do now. We do need some more technology development, but not an excessive amount, I don't think. Right. right. 
So, is that and, fair? And, and it's true, and as yeah. part of our reports, we do submit a technology yeah. roadmap mm -hmm. yeah. for the, the, so the elements of each of these ambitious telescopes yeah. and which parts are unique that need that more development. Because yeah. um, we're talking launch in the 2030s, mid-2030s. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that does make these studies somewhat unique compared to previous studies, is that these really are science and technology LG. definition teams, and we're going from the science questions and we're mapping them all the way to the technologies and the architectures we need in order to answer those science questions and making sure that we're dotting all of our I's and crossing all of our T's. So your, your point about our ability to manipulate at the atomic level now. Right. So theoretically then, like the, the, uh, the star shade, the technology behind the star shade um, isn't so bleeding edge. No, it's not um, anymore. It used to be. It used to be, ago, right. But not anymore. So maybe for each of you, you could just briefly say for, for the, uh, your particular <laughs> instrument concept, um, whether it has sort of technology development challenges, in other words, technologies that must be developed in order for this to work that don't yet exist, and then what they are, or if, it, if, it, in, if they do not. Good. We're all basically at the same stage in that we're trying to do ambitious projects, and some of my colleagues will talk about having a single tooth fairy or two tooth fairies where right. you can have one or two crazy things in your concept <laughs> and everything else needs to pan out, but when you think about it, we're designing something that would launch in the mid to late 2030s. And I have things in my apartment that I would never have dreamed of owning 20 years ago. So that's I have just a cat in my house, which I <laughs> would never have dreamed of owning. But anyway. I was thinking more about the really powerful computer that fits in all of our pockets. But the cats are nice, too. Dogs are better. Uh, I probably lost votes with that. I kind of agree with why I've got an issue with the cat. Yes, but yes. Anyway. Uh, so for Louvoir, one of our big challenges is that we need to be able to do the starlight suppression really well. And Scott discussed a lot of the challenges for how to do that. One of those challenges is that we need to know exactly where all of the segments in the mirrors are. And we've developed technologies to do that, but it's still tricky. And we also need to have the telescope be extremely stable. We actually need picometer stability. So that's one of our biggest challenges. The other big challenge for us is that we need to have very low read noise detectors, which means when we take an image, it needs to be very clear and crisp and not have any fuzzy stuff that's produced by systematics. Um, and we think that we're on a path to be able to do both of those things. And we've identified what needs to be done in the next 10 years to make a facility like Louvoir buildable and flyable in the late 2030s. Yeah, I, I will say and I, that I think, again, I think this is true for all of the studies is that Part of our studies is, is actually not just saying what technologies are at the bleeding edge, right? Because um, all of us have technologies, let's face it, that are challenging. Yeah. Um, we're not going to lie to you. Uh, <laughs> suppressing starlight by a factor of 10 billion is, is kind, of cra kind of crazy if you think about <laughs> it. But we think we know how to do it. And that's, that's the thing is, I mean, as crazy as it sounds, it's actually we're within shouting distance and being able to do it. Um, I will say that HabEx has taken, as I said, a more conservative philosophy where we've tried to minimize the number of technologies. And so there have been several cases where we've had uh, trades uh, and where we would have had to adopt a technology that was lower, what NASA calls technology readiness level. You don't need to know what it means, but it means more bleeding edge. Um, we've chosen not to include that, uh, and we have it as an enhancing technology if there were funding to try to develop that technology. So HabEx tends to have, compared to Louvoir, and I'm not, I haven't, haven't done exactly the comparison to OSD, um, fewer of these more difficult technologies. We don't qu require quite the picometer stability. It's hard. It's, you know, it's tens of, or 100, or 100 picometers, but it's not a picometer. But that's intentional because, um, and, and we're going to have to say this eventually, so we might as well start saying it now. Um, you may notice a lot of similarities between Habex and Louvoir, right, in terms of the science that they're planning on doing. Uh, their architectures are very different, the way they look, but the science they're trying to do is very similar. Uh, we're trying to be like the next great observatory like Hubble, uh, but we're also trying to do this thing that we can only do for the first time in human history, detect and characterize Earth-like planets around sun-like stars. Um, and uh, and so what we're, but so Louvoir and Habex have been working together now for the the last three years, to try to present these two missions as sort of ends of a buffet of options that can achieve this kind of science that depending on how brave or how much money you want to spend or whatever, um, you might decide something on one end or something on the other end. Uh, I firmly believe that, um, that something like Louvar will eventually happen. Will, will it be the next thing? I don't know. Um, and I personally, and I'll just throw this out here right now, I would love to see all four of these missions fly because they're all four do 
amazing science. Sure. Right. And we do have very complementary wavelength coverage. Right. So it would yeah. be nice to see something like OST and then a Havex Louvoir merger. Yeah. And origins are um, our biggest technology challenges are detectors. Mm -hmm. um, so I had mentioned that the telescope's at 4.5 Kelvin, um, and that's doable with, with existing cryocoolers or the evolution of cryocoolers. Our detectors are at millikelvin. And so we have work to do with the different refrigerators that will cool down those detectors. And that's on a technology path that's mapped out. The other big challenge is arrays of detectors. We have demonstrated um, the sensitivity of the tensor detectors we need for the science in single pixel right now. And to do our mapping, because we have this amazing telescope that can map all over the sky and take spectra and images, we need to have arrays of these detectors. And we need to put those arrays together, and then they will generate heat. And so we have to do this balance. So you're going to add more pixels with a lot more electronics. We have to then dump all that cold. That's all part of our. So it's our technology uh, readiness roadmap is getting lots of pixels and keeping them cold. And well, we're doing that in a very incremental way right now. I think it's yeah. fair to say that uh, yeah. you know, in defense of bleeding edge technology, which if you want to do something cool and new, you, you have to push the envelope. That's right. uh, the Kepler Space Telescope, I mean, uh, when Bill Baruchi first proposed that to NASA, they, they told him he was crazy and it would never work, that the technology didn't exist. It took five efforts, five times, for Bill uh, to put that forward and finally get it funded. So uh, I, I think it's more than appropriate to be looking at, at technologies which, uh, which right now we, we kind of understand how to do them but, but haven't yet developed them. I, I'd like to throw in, I, I, I don't think maybe this, this was mentioned specifically, but all four of these mission studies um, are paired with a NASA center. Right. Um, and, the, and of course, NASA, as we know, um, are some of the, the best people in the world to be able to develop these kinds of technologies and enable these fantastic, amazing missions that just floor you with the kind of science and discoveries that they make. Um, so it's not just a bunch of scientists sort of scratching their heads thinking, wow, let's you know, do this and using duct tape or whatever. There's actually <laughs> real engineers that know how to do these things and understand these problems and how to solve them or at least ways in which they might be able to solve them. And so that's, that's an important component of these studies is working very closely with the engineers. NASA has centers. more advanced duct tape than... Almost anybody. Yeah. Yeah. And duct tape that works at cold temperatures. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> du duct tape is the first step, though, I will say. I've seen, I've seen duct tape in, in labs. Before. So, Scott, I have a, another question for you, um, and, and I think maybe this comes into the category of the G whiz. I think it would be really interesting for people to get an understanding of scale when you start talking about the star shade. Yeah. How large is it? How far will it be from the telescope when actual uh, images are being collected. So give us a sense of that, of that scale. So it's roughly the size of a baseball diamond, um, 52 meters. Uh, the, you can scale the size depending on the aperture of the telescope and exactly what your requirements are, but it's roughly 52 meters uh, from tip to tip. Um, and uh, in terms of how far away you have to fly, it has to be flown somewhere between uh, 70,000 to 100,000 kilometers away. Uh, and then <laughs> from has the to, telescope. From the telescope. And then has to be aligned to within a few what uh, uh, a few basically feet uh, th in this direction, a few millimeters in this direction. Um, so, th again, this all sounds very hard because right, you, you can't you have to r roll this thing up in a fancy way where it wants to unroll. They've actually solved that problem. It's pretty amazing. I was in a lab at JPL where they have one of these things un uh, rolled up. And it's being, and it really wants, it really wants to unroll. Right? And so I asked the engineers, I said, should I be afraid standing next yeah. to this thing? Because if one of these things breaks, is this, one of these pedals going to fly out and kill me? And they're like, no, 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 we got that all figured out. Um, but, uh, Alaska. but yeah, it's, 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 it's hard, but a lot of it, um, it's amazing how far we've come. And we've now built half scale models of these pedals that have the tolerances that we need in order to do this. Um, so, uh, so yeah, and, and we figured out how to roll them up using these techniques of origami such that they will naturally want to unroll by themselves to this precise shape. And we've demonstrated that we, we can repeat this over and over again, uh, and it'll always unfurl to exactly the tolerance we need of this one millimeter. And the formation flying you might think is hard, but if you're, anyway, you're familiar with the Lisa Pathfinder, um, that was demonstrating formation flying as well because that was considered one of the tall poles of LISA and it was fabulously successful. So we've made a lot of progress 
Well, we've, we've got New Horizons within 2,200 which miles of the surface of this sounds uh, like object a four sounds billion like a, miles a away. miracle, right? <laughs> yeah. it's, it's pretty miraculous. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I don't want uh, the starshade to dominate the conversation, but it is interesting that what sounds like the more sort of mechanical, physical thing here is, is garnering uh, much of the interest. Be, you know, the rest is just optics, electronics, detectors, you know. <laughs> yeah. ah, no but this origami <laughs> thing is, is pretty cool. I will point out, though, for, <laughs> as a representative for the mission without the starshade, that you have to wait for the starshade to get into position. Exactly. So <laughs> that's okay, uh, so that's a, the If you want to ask question. me that question, yeah. I said I could, I'll answer that question. Yes. Okay, yeah. so, How long does it take right. to set it up? Yeah, so, so starshades are great, except when they're not. Um, and <laughs> chronographs, chrono, chronographs are great when they're not. Um, so... The bad, the star shades are great because they do, ha they do ha are very good at blocking out light, um, and a lot of these these issues are really just kind of mechanical or engineering, not so much, um, not so much really technology development. But um, but yes, you have to move. This is a big thing. It's a big gyroscope if you're thinking about it because we're spinning it too, um, and then you have to move it all around because the stars are all around the sky. So we can really only have an. And then it's you're the tyranny of the rocket equation. The more fuel you put on, the more fuel you need. The more fuel you put on, the more fuel you need, etc. Um, and so we can only move this thing around to about about a hundred times um, uh, before we run out of fuel. That's why working with the coronagraph is great. Although it doesn't suppress light nearly as well, okay, and it's a lot harder, and you have to make your telescope more stable in order to, to correct these things like the, um, the wave front, um, it's very nimble because it's in your telescope, so you can just point wherever you want. So we have a strategy where we point at a bunch of stars, find the potentially Earth-like planets, move the star shade to those systems that we think might have an Earth-like planet, take the spectra, and see if indeed it does have these biomarkers. Yeah. OST is in even better shape. They're already going to know where their our targets are, due, yes. thanks to tests and yeah. Earth and these other these other st systems like that. So how long? And this is uh, a question I have, and and um, uh, Clay was asking this question from our our audience, uh, our virtual audience. How long will it take to reposition the starshade to another target? A few months. A few months. A month or something. A month or so. But meanwhile, the, the telescope is still able to do science. Mean, meanwhile, the rest of the time, you can either use the chronograph to look and characterize both Earth-like planets and larger planets, as, as Courtney talked about. I mean, our bar chart does not look as impressive as theirs, right? <laughs> uh, the Louvoir is a much, a much more ambitious and much more capable mission. Obviously, um, can I quote you on that? But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've said this in public. Before. I know, I know. And uh, uh, you have the advantage we, of getting the red wavelengths for a lot of planets yeah, where we wouldn't. Get yeah. Them. So, we, so, but, um, but, uh, but, 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 like Courtney said, you know, there's this this other half of the science case that um, maybe if you're not interested in planets, you're not as interested in. But, uh, but, the, but, you know, we can do everything, almost everything that Hubble can do, except better, because we're four meters. And Louvoir can do everything that Hubble can do, except a heck of a lot better, because, you know, they're nine meters or slash 15 <laughs> meters. Um, and OST, uh, Desi Herschel is the closest thing we've ever had, and it's not even and close. It's not even close. Well, right. We said we're in this transformational realm that we don't really know what we're going to see with right. the Origins yeah. telescope. Three orders of magnitude, better right. than Herschel which was an ESA telescope that was our best uh, far infrared telescope to date. So Lavoir mm -hmm. looks like um, the James Webb Space Telescope, but bigger, right? A much bigger. A lot bigger. bigger. Right. Is that the, the, the primary differentiator? Is, is this just, you know, a James Webb on steroids, or is there much more to no, it? No, no. So we are building off some of the lessons learned from James Webb. In particular, mm -hmm. we're being really careful about making sure we're thinking about all of the nitty-gritty details, that when we do have a cost estimate, it's as accurate as possible. Yep. Um, and we also, the name Louvoir includes the UV and the optical as well. So with James Webb, we'll do a lot of great science in the near-infrared and some of the optical, but we won't have the ability to look at the universe with ultraviolet eyes. And we need to do that to really understand stars and to understand galaxies. And it'll be really sad when Hubble goes offline if we don't have an ability to look at the universe that way. All right. So we're going to open this up to uh, audience questions in one second. I'm going to give each of our scientists uh, an opportunity to give one short statement about what's the key differentiator, what's the key so what about their mission that uh, should really be the reason why you say up and stand up and say, I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'll pay for that. Let's start with Kimberly. <laughs> oh, well, origins um, will give us definitive new understanding of our cosmic 
where we came from, the beginnings of these elements. And um, that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and it, it is an observatory for a whole range of astrophysical phenomena. We're doing solar system. We're doing stars, planets, pre-planets, exoplanets, uh, galaxies, all the way to the back. Um, to Would you the, say it's it's more uh, diverse in, in its science mission than the it other is, It has a very broad science. Yeah. And, in, and we're really excited with gravitational wave astronomy that's emerging. We'll be able to do those, uh, those follow-ups and understand um, a lot of the physics because um, we'll be able to study the heat and the thermal emission of black holes merging. So we can contribute to these emerging sciences too. It's very diverse. And any yeah. truth to the rumor that Dan Brown named his book Origins after <laughs> the telescope? Or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All about where we came from. All right, Scott, you're up. Uh, so, uh, HabEx will allow us, for the first time in human history, to take the first step at being able to go and find the pale blue dot, dots, in Carl Sagan's words, uh, the Earth-like planets around the sun-like stars, take their spectra, look for, see if they're potentially habitable, and look for signs of inhabitants uh, of simple, cell, uh, simple, simple um, life. And it will also be a, a great observatory in following in the tradition of Hubble. That's a pretty good pitch. All right. <laughs> Courtney. Louvoir is also a great observatory um, designed to answer the questions we have today as well as the questions that we will discover in the 2030s and 40s. It's serviceable and upgradable and could have an operational lifetime of 100 years and answer a variety of questions in a wide range of astrophysics. We'll find planets around other stars. We'll characterize them. We'll study entire planetary systems. We'll also look at galaxies and understand our universe a little bit better. And what I like best about Louvoir is that I'm excited about the mission, but so are my extragalactic astronomy friends. And I think if we're <laughs> going to build a big flagship mission, it has to serve the whole community, and Louvoir will. Excellent. All right, so the coolest telescope, literally, is... Uh, origins, <laughs> <Technically>. but <laughs> so all right. Show of hands. Who's for? You can only pick one. Who wants to go with origins? All right, a lot of lot of support for the cool telescope. How about Habex, the pale blue dot? Yeah, it's pretty even. Pretty even. A little maybe a little edge to origins and Louvoir. Oh, yes, thank oh, you. Okay. All right, well, um, so, so the dog comment, matters. right? We'd like to give you a chance to ask uh, this esteemed panel some questions. If you'd like to ask a question, just please line up behind the microphone here. I uh, would ask to try to keep your questions short and succinct. Please try and address them to one individual uh, and, and name that person so they can respond to you. And, uh, you know, be mindful that we'll probably have a number of people who'd like to ask. And, yes, yeah, speak into the microphone as, as best you can so everybody can hear you. Well, thank you. I, I'm going to violate your rule because I wanted to ask an co estimated cost from each of you. And given that James Webb had notoriously had some cost overruns, w what is your strategy for managing, for cost management? All right. In brief. Cost and cost management strategy. So... I'll start. Uh, I don't know, and I wouldn't tell you if I did. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure they'll say the same thing. Right. We're but just wait, and the, you'll learn from the decadal survey how much how yeah. much an independent entity will cost these things, and that's what really matters in terms of keeping the cost to where we think we it is. That's why we're doing these technology studies. That's why we have these technology roadmaps. That's why these studies have been going on for three, and by the time they finish three and three quarters years, is because we are really dotting all of our I's and crossing our T's and making sure we really know that when we say we can do this, or we will be able to do it with this investment of technology money, that we really, really will be able to accomplish that. So when you submit the STDT, it will include a budget? It will. Yes. But it will, you're, you don't yes. have those budgets yet. You we do not have those right. budgets yet. And they will undergo an independent cost assessment by an, an aerospace corporation because we're trying to build something for the very first time, yet we have a little bit more knowledge basically on what we went through with James Webb. Um, but each of the telescope designs are also different. Right. Um, so it is on, you know, under a lot of scrutiny. Yeah. Good question. All right, next up. A couple brief ones. Um, K 
can you use the moon or other planets as starshades? And can you build a better reaction wheel? Better, build a better? Better reaction wheel so telescopes don't die. <laughs> a Kepler reference. The moon's really bright. Yeah. I want to use it as a starshade. Yeah, we don't want... Uh, I can answer the re reaction wheels. Lu uh, Habex does not have reaction wheels. We are, us we are using thrusters. Yeah. Specifically because reaction wheels have this bad property that they can you hit resonances and your telescope vibrates, which makes it really hard to do coronography. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a different cost cap for this mission than the missions you're thinking of with the reaction wheel issues. So I, was a discovery I actually don't know. What is, what is OSC using? Well, we're using reaction wheels okay. and also a variety of different other systems because we need to be fast to scan mm -hmm. fast and to dump that momentum. And so there's a lot of over-engineering into to make sure that those are not a, on the critical um, path for us because we want to be scanning the sky. So we want to be moving a lot. Great question. All right. Hi, thanks for the good discussion. Um, could you say something more uh, about the science, the information you can get uh, from direct imaging versus uh, spectroscopy, for example? Good question. So the question was, what's the difference in the science we can gain from direct imaging versus spectroscopic analysis? Right. So in this era for the 2030s, we're thinking of doing direct imaging, but also taking spectra of those same planets. Today, from the ground, people are doing direct imaging and finding planets that are much more massive than Jupiter, typically much farther away from the star than Jupiter is, and also extremely young. And they're starting to do spectroscopy, but they're getting very coarse spectra that looks a little bit more like photometry. So you get maybe five or six points across your spectrum. In a handful of cases, it's higher resolution. You can start to see more features. For us, though, getting the spectra is really useful because we can see which molecules we have in the planet's atmosphere. Yeah, and we, have a, we are using a, the transit technique where we're looking at when the planet goes in front of the star and also when it goes behind. So we can get a primary and a secondary transit. So we can actually um, understand the, the molecules in the atmosphere because uh, we can see on the edge. But we can also assess the temperature of the body as well. Um, and that's helpful for uh, folding in the models of whether water would be in a liquid form. So Spectre's telling us composition, but we can also use the technique to get temperature as well. Yeah. And Lubor and Habex can do that as well. For the sun-like stars with Earth-like planets, we'll primarily do direct imaging, but for M dwarfs, yeah. smallest stars, Sorry. we can do the transit method. So yeah. the, the exoplanet community as a whole, um, I think this is fair to say, uh, not, 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 it's not a unanimous opinion, but it's probably the majority opinion, feel like both of these paths, uh, one is called the small star opportunity, mm -hmm. um, where we try to look for potentially habitable planets around low mass stars, which are the most common stars in the galaxy, and then eventually go and try to do this with the, uh, using something like JWST and then in the future maybe OST, um, and then also doing direct imaging of spectra of Earth-like planets orbiting sun-like stars. Um, so those are sort of two paths you can go by, yeah, according to Led Zeppelin. Anyway, and I think we should, and I, I and, and most of my exoplanet colleagues think we should do both. There's one path that's open to us right now, and then the Habex and Louvoir path will be open to us in the future. Right. And there's also a bunch of telescopes that we're building on the ground oh, yeah, that right. are 30 thank, meters thank across, you. which yeah. we haven't yeah. talked about. Which we haven't talked about. Yeah. Um, but they can take images and spectra of planets in the habitable zones of M dwarfs. Right. I mean, images are spectacular. It's like, wow, mm -hmm. you can see the planet. But well, spectroscopy gives you composition and a lot, of, a lot more information. Yes. Yeah, just to be clear, both will give spectroscopy. That's yeah. a very essential point to make. Yeah. It's just around different types of stars for the most part. <laughs> so, Courtney, thanks for the lead-in to my question. Great. Uh, in addition to uh, the space telescopes that your teams are working on, we have a number of uh, ground-based efforts, the 30-meter telescope, the extremely large telescope, and so on. Mm -hmm. Could you say more to compare and contrast um, the science that uh, you know, the two, two types of telescopes will do? I think having both of them will really enrich in our scientific experience because from the ground, we have to deal with weather. You can build the best telescope in the world, but if it's raining, you're not opening, especially if not the best telescope in the world. Um, and from the ground, you also have to deal with the moon getting in the way. You have to deal with the fact that the Earth's in the way some of the times. So you have limited viewing opportunities. And these transits of planets in the habitable zones of sun-like stars happen once per year. For M dwarfs, you have more opportunities, but it's still hard. So direct imaging is useful because you're less time sensitive, but when you observe, you can't do it all the time, but you have a broader range of options. And you also, from the ground, can't see all of the wavelengths. There are certain yeah. things that are atmosphere blocks, so you have to go to space to do certain types of science. Yeah. It is possible to detect oxygen in the atmosphere of a planet on the ground from Earth, but it's really hard because we also have oxygen in our own atmosphere. So to do that for an Earth-like planet is easier to do from space 
And if you're trying to study a planet in the habitable zone of a sun-like star, we don't think we can reach the contrast required to block the starlight from the ground. Yeah, so this 10 billion factor is probably not po possible to do from the ground. I did want to throw in, just since I'm from the Midwest, um, for those of you that, were, that felt like you had to like, go through this horrible weather conditions to get here, <laughs> wow. <laughs> when they told me that my flight was delayed to SFO because of weather, I was laughing. We had like, six, inches of, six inches of snow in Columbus, Ohio last week. <laughs> Well, you had the polar vortex I know, yeah, exactly. before that. So. I mean, right. yeah, we're, 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 we're spoiled out here. <laughs> Thank you for come braving the weather. And, and, <laughs> although it does infer a lot at lick. And for origins, um, um, will be complementary to the ground base. You can't do the, in, the far infrared from the ground because mm -hmm. the Earth's atmosphere blocks. But with these 30 meter telescopes and their studies in extragalactic science, we're very complementary. Uh, looking at the same I mean, you've got to do both. I mean, but right. I mean one of We're the other advantages both. of We're a ground-based instrument yeah. is, yeah. you know, you can, as technology evolves, you can put new back ends, new detectors, new electronics, which is tough to do once you've got a telescope in space. But the space will give you opportunities that you can't possibly do from ground-based. So both are good. Sir? Uh, I was a little surprised that stars are shaped like the sun on the Raisin Bran box. I, <laughs> oh, why is it shaped like that? Yeah, yeah I, the, I, the sunflower. Shape. I really don't understand why you have these great, great things question. around. What it's I a, would have expected to be. It's a, it's a great question. I, you might think it would just be a disc, right? Yeah. So, okay. So the 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 issue is that uh, when the light hits the edge of that disc, it uh, it it diffracts, and it actually diffracts exactly to the center. So if you actually had a disc like that and you pointed it and you put it at the star, you would have an extremely bright spot right, right at the center, the exactly where you don't want it. <laughs> so if you look at those petals, you can imagine that everywhere the light hits it, it diffracts it away from the telescope, right? That's how the edges are shaped. And so they have a very specific mathematical form called a hypergaussian, if you care, um, <laughs> that uh, des is designed to diffract all the light away from the telescope, not into your telescope. I I'd still recommend you you try to get the Raisin Bran guys to uh, we, sponsor I, oh, So yeah, a friend of mine calls it the Space Daisy. I like Aww, the Space Daisy. Yeah, Space Daisy. I like that. <laughs> Thank you for that question. <laughs> <laughs> if I'd been doing my job better, I would have asked that already. Very good question. <laughs> okay, two questions. Uh, what orbit are you each of you in and deployment? We're at L2, okay. um, nice and far away. I think we're and all explain at L2. Maybe we're, we're all at L2. L2 oh. for, yeah. for we're in the Sun Earth L2. Yeah, okay, so we're out at. Lunar distance, we're very far away. It'll take us about three months to get there. We're all at L2. We're all at, we're all all at Sun Earth L2. Sun Earth L2. And so for those of you who don't know, it's, it's one of the, the Lagrange points that is a relatively quiet and stable space uh, that's on the other side of the uh, Earth from the uh, Sun. So we have a video showing that on our website, and you should definitely watch it. Um, it's set up like the James Webb deployment, but it's actually a little bit simpler. Um, and if you're curious about how it works in real life, we have a Lego model that you can find on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> and that deploys basically the same way, but it requires human intervention because of gravity. Yeah, well, yeah. and that person was supposed to be calculating yields for us, but instead was building oh, a Lego he, model. <laughs> he didn't yield too. I think um, he just never bought groceries so or anything. So for, for Habex, you've, the, only, the, mo the main deployment is the, sun sh and su the star shade, and you've seen that already. Yeah, and our, our deployment is the um, Sun Shield. So um, we stack as a single entity in the pairing, pairing of SLS or BFR. Um, and then as we launch, the fairing comes off, and then our, our shield just rolls out, just sort of it's concave. That's it. And then we have an aperture cover that we toss away. Oh, yeah, we do that too. <laughs> <laughs> the camera lens. We got to take the lens off the camera. <laughs> yeah. Oops, <laughs> I knew I forgot to do something. <laughs> Next up. So. This being said, I think uh, you know, I'd like to ask about life. Um, your thoughts as a panel, what are your thoughts between seeing like what we'll see first, you know, artificial, like a Dyson sphere, uh, organic, just kind of like a signature, or nothing at all? So here's my opinion. Uh, it's not always popular in astronomy, is that um, the, the way I think the, these three missions are going about it is, is to try to apply the scientific method. Um, so, you know, first we found out that there were, well, there are planets around other stars, and we found out that there's actually a lot of small planets around other stars. Um, eventually we'll figure out wh how frequent uh, solar system architectures like ours with rocky planets inside, gas giants outside are. Uh, we'll find Earth-like planets, then we'll try to study their atmospheres and see if they have life. Um, so that's kind of doing the scientific method step by step. Um, I personally believe in what I, what I would call a balanced portfolio. So I think that you should put a small amount of your investment in very high risk, 
but high payoff activities. So I personally think that that you sh that that we as a, as a as a um, science that's looking for life should in fact in fact invest at least some fraction of our money in this what I would think what I, I think is a fairly uncontroversial statement a little bit more high risk but certainly would be amazingly transformative to Absolutely. all of human and uh, humans if if it was actually successful that's my opinion you I, either of you want to weigh in as well it's it's a good question I agree and I think that for things like subtle life detection of signatures in planetary atmospheres having a large number of planets will help us understand what we're seeing so if we only had one planet where we saw hints of life, we could come up with a bunch of theories to explain that one planet, but that's more dangerous than having 50 planets where for each of those planets we come up with a theory and those theories have to work together in tandem to explain the whole set of observations we have. I also think that in the future we're going to need to work even more closely with our biologists and geologists and chemists friends so that we understand what life is from a biological perspective, not just an astrophysical perspective. Yeah, we can have, we can have blinders True. on for identifying a priori what the signatures of life right. is. And we've designed our instruments to measure the methane and the ozone and chosen the wavelengths to isolate those molecules. But most likely we're going to get spectra we don't understand. Right. And that is going to be where we're going to need uh, laboratory um, experiments to put lots of different types of chemistry together and then uh, we may even lead to um, a white, much wider discussion about what are the signatures of life. I, I probably don't have to tell this audience, but you know, when I started this three and a little over years ago, I, w I was not up on the uh, current state of astrobiology. I will be very uh, frank about that, and I'm a little know a little bit more, but enormous amount. I said I talked about a lot of things that have happened over the last ten years that make these kinds of studies possible, and one of them is that astrobiology has developed into a is into an amazing, vibrant, sci multidisciplinary science where people are really starting to try to understand what are the false positives, what mm -hmm. are the false negatives, um, and, and really trying to help us craft our experiments so that we can address these questions, because I agree with you, we're probably just not going to understand. We're, we're going to get some spectra that we right. just won't know all the features, and we're going to model the heck out of it. And mm -hmm. then we're going to have to have safety in numbers. We're going to have to have some statistical samples in order to make some sort of headway. Um, yeah, I agree. So the next question is from someone who knows a little bit of something about the quest for life in the universe. Penny Boston actually heads NASA's Astrobiology Institute. So <laughs> Penny, uh, your turn. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to refrain from asking an astrobiology question. <laughs> but, um, Can we ask you ask her? Ask her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anything you want to know. There's a few things I want to just, yeah. yeah, I'm sure I have the market cornered on all knowledge about this. Um, so with my skeptical, cynical NASA bureaucrat hat on. We have hats for purchase. Uh, I, I, I have a whole wardrobe of <laughs> You know, and living through the era of James Webb, as we are all painfully doing, how will your different missions fare with a radical descope? Uh, how much very... science can you do if I cut you off at the knees? Very good question. For Louvoir, we're in a yeah. different position than the other studies because Louvoir and Habex were initially conceived as like two opposites of what you could do for a mission that does both exoplanets and general astrophysics. So if yeah. you cut us in half, you end up with Habex. Um, right. So we are studying eight other uh, architectures, um, mm -hmm. uh, each of which are either smaller in aperture than the four meter. So our, our main architecture, our favorite architecture, preferred architecture is a four meter hybrid, a hybrid by I mean chronograph and starship, right. uh, with also these general observatory uh, instruments. We are studying eight other architectures that are either smaller in aperture or don't have the star shade or don't have a chronograph. Um, those able to allow you to relax and, and get rid of some of the lower technology, the more risky technologies. Yeah. Um, but they don't achieve the full complement of science that the, our preferred architecture does. So all so, of your architectures, though, still involve this, uh, the star daisy. The star shade? <laughs> the star shade. No, no, no. Some of them are just okay, so, chronographs. Right. Yeah, exactly. Because the star shade is, to, to be honest, one of our l more uh, lower, uh, it's a, a more nascent technology than some yes. of our other technologies. Yes. I followed it since its birth. Right. Right. So. <laughs> and, 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 and on origins, about, we, we yeah. went through a massive descope already when we went from our grand design to this more still very effective um, concept. We also have a descope path. 
And one of them is trading aperture. How small can we go? We're at 5.9 meters. Um, once you go slower, some of your science goes. And so we have yeah. a degradation of our science. To preserve the exoplanet science, uh, we need to stay at about 5.3 meters. To preserve our extragalactic uh, cosmic uh, survey, we can go down to three meters because uh, we still have these three orders of magnitude. It just if hits the science level at different yeah, times. Yeah, but you lose the exoplanets. Exoplanets is our, yeah. is our highest bar that yeah. keeps us as big as we are right now. Okay. Um, other descopes we can do that we've explored, um, raising our temperature. Um, we, um, the higher we go, say we go to 6 Kelvin, we start having a degradation at our longest wavelengths. And so that becomes a trade. We want to preserve that as much as possible because that is truly our, our, leap, our leap forward. Yeah, your very longest wavelengths. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the, um, uh, I think the interesting thing about descoping is, you know, I, it, it, maybe it's, it's okay as a concept for NASA, and Penny knows something about, about that. I don't want to be on the, the plane, however, that was a result of a descoped <laughs> <laughs> budget process. All right, time for one more question. How will the way forward be impacted by the success or failure of the James Webb Space Telescope? <laughs> oh, the hardest question. question of all question. comes Wait. last. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the timing is a bit awkward because James Webb isn't supposed to start until spring 2021, and we're doing the 2020 decadal survey. So a lot of the discussions will happen before we know whether James Webb will launch successfully. Um, but my guess is that if James Webb flies and is successful, which I think it will be, I think it's going to be a tremendous success, we landed a sky crane on Mars, we can do this, um, <laughs> then that will be a nice sense of optimism for the community. I think right now we're at the low point in terms of people's regard for flagship missions because they feel frustrated about all the money and time sunk into James Webb and they haven't seen the science yet. But the science is going to be fantastic. If James Webb is unsuccessful, um, then we're going to have a more pessimistic era. But I think that even that would come to an end eventually. And I'm pretty, at the, I'm pretty much at the start of my career as a scientist, so I have faith <laughs> that I'll see one of these things fly. She does. She does make me, you know, not, you know, get really depressed because she's always so chipper. Um, <laughs> I, I, I agree with everything she said. I, I will just emphasize one more time that um, the way we are going about these studies is to try to minimize as much as possible the, um, the skepticism about whether or not we can actually achieve them because we really are really looking at them in, in extremely fine detail and being very, very careful. Um, so if any mission were to convince a decadal survey that we really know what we're talking about and we can achieve these things, I think these four mission studies would, uh, uh, would be able to do that. They're, really they're a healthy them. reminder that we know less about the universe now than we think we claimed we do, and we have a lot more questions to be answered. And James Webb is going to answer a lot, and there's still going to be a lot more you know, for NASA, us to answer. Na mm, sorry, go ahead. Hmm. I mean, NASA's, NASA is, is supposed to be inspiring, right? Um, I, think, I think we all, uh, at one point in our lives, were, uh, and, and still, for many of us, still are, um, inspired by the things that NASA has achieved. Um, and, and so that's why I'm so excited about all these mission concepts because they really are incredible in the, in, in, the, in the new frontiers that they open up, the questions that they can answer, things we've been wondering about for centuries, we can finally answer them if we just have the wherewithal and the, you know, just pluckiness to it's just go power. and do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, that's a, a great way to end. I would ask you to join me in thanking our panel for what I thought was a wonderful <laughs> session.